My name is Esther Wilson. I live in South Sioux City, Nebraska. My husband and I will have some new money in the early 80s of our lifehood. We have a daughter 50 years old who will inherit anything we have. My question is, is um, I also have a 4% interest on a mutual fund that is non-taxable. Are there any better ways to invest our money? Well, those are tough questions. I mean, I, you know, I, and I, and I, you know, I run into friends of mine all the time where they they come into a lump sum at a given time, or, and uh, you know, Charlie and I do not have great answers about about uh, uh, investing sums of money. I for people who are not really active in the process. I mean, if as we said earlier, if we, if we were working with small sums now, we would start looking at a whole bunch of very small situations and some things that we might know, know how to do on a small scale. But for the, for the average investor uh, who wants to own equities over a 20 or 30 year period, we think regular investment in some kind of very low cost uh, pool of money, which might well be an index fund, probably makes as much sense as anything. But it's important to keep the cost down. Um, you know, I have close to 100 percent of my net worth in Berkshire. I'm comfortable with it because I like the businesses we own. And uh, but you know, I didn't buy it at this price either. So I don't. I don't like to go. I, I never recommend anybody buy or sell it. And Charlie, do you recommend anything? I I think it's. If there's anybody in the room who thinks it would be very easy to come up with a one-liner for a great no-brainer investment tomorrow with a great slug of new money. I wish they'd come up and tell me what it is. We don't have any solution to that one. It, it's harder for us now than it has been at other times. Yeah, there's been a couple of times. In 1974, there was something in Forbes, and 69, the reverse of that situation, and then I think I wrote an article for Forbes, I can't remember exactly when it was, about how equities almost had to be more attractive than bonds at that time, and bonds weren't that unattractive. I mean, every now and then you can, you can say you are getting a, a great deal for your money in equities, or sometimes you can say you're getting a great deal for your money in fixed income investments. Uh, you can't say that now, so what do you do? You know, it, uh, uh, in terms of new money, we, we find ourselves sitting and waiting for something, and, and we continue to look. But we are forced to look at bigger ideas. So if we were working with smaller funds, we, we'd be much more likely to find something than we, we are in our present situation. Uh, as Charlie says, we, we, we really don't have any great one-line advice on it. I wish we did. Zone well, I, four, go ahead. The, the real long-term rate of return from uh, saving money and investing it has to go down from recent experience uh, in America, particularly equity-related recent experience. The wealth of the world can't increase at the kind of rates that people are used to in the American equity markets, and the American equity markets can't hugely outperform the growth of the wealth of the world forever. Uh, we, well, ought, we ought to have reduced expectations regarding the future generally. Because, you know, we mentioned earlier 53 percent of the, the world's stock market value is in the U.S. Well, if U.S. GDP grows at 4 percent, 5 percent a year with 1 or 2 percent inflation, which would be a pretty – would be a very good result. I think it's very unlikely that corporate profits are going to grow at a greater rate than that. Corporate profits as a percent of GDP are on the high side already, and you can't constantly have corporate profits grow at a faster rate than GDP. And, uh, uh, obviously, in the end, they'd be greater than GDP. And it's like somebody said that New York has more lawyers than people. I mean, there, there, <laughs> there's, there's certain – you run into certain conflicts in the terminology as you go along if you say profits can get bigger than GDP. so. If you really have a situation where the best you can hope for in corporate profit growth over the years is 4 or 5 percent, how can it be reasonable to think that equities, which are a capitalization of that corporate 
uh, of corporate profits can grow at 15 percent a year. I mean, it is nonsense, frankly. And people are not going to average 15 percent or anything like it uh, in equities. And uh, uh, I would almost defy them to show me mathematically how it can be done in aggregate. Uh, I looked the other day at the Fortune 500. They earned $334 billion on it and had a market cap of $9.9 trillion at the end of the year, which would probably be at least $10.5 trillion now. Well, the only money investors are going to make in the long run are what the businesses make. I mean, there is nothing added. The government doesn't throw in anything. You know, nobody's adding to the pot. People are taking out from the pot in terms of frictional costs investment management fees, brokerage commissions, and all of that. But the $334 million is all that it's all the investment earns. I mean, if you own a farm, the, what the farm produces is all you're going to get from the farm. If it produces, you know, $50 an acre of net profit, you get $50 an acre of net profit. And, and there's nothing about it that transforms that in some miraculous form. If you own all of American, if you own all of the Fortune 500 now, if you own 100 percent of us, you would be making $334 billion. And, uh, if you pay ten, ten and a half trillion for that, that is not a great return on an investment. And then you say to yourself, can that double in five years? It can't, the 334 billion, it can't double in five years with GDP growing at 4% a year or some number like that. It would, it would, it would just produce things that are so out of whack uh, in terms of experience in the American economy, it, it won't happen. So. Anytime you get involved in these things where if you trace out the mathematics of it, you bump into absurdities, uh, then you better ch change expectations somewhat. Charlie? Yeah. Well, there are two great sayings. Uh, one is, uh, if a thing can't go on forever, it will eventually stop. And, <laughs> and the other I borrow from my friend Fred Stanback, who I think is here. Uh, People who expect uh, perpetual growth and real wealth in a finite earth uh, are either madmen or economists. 